Ladies and gentlemen, after a long time, I am um, <clears throat> resuming my TV show, Author to Author series. And uh, today we have an honorable guest in our studio, uh, Dr. Professor Paget Henry of Brown University. And uh, I, this is not the first time uh, I'm having this encounter, intellectual encounter with him, but uh, we have uh, this uh, intellectual friendship for a long time. It started when I was uh, in Brown, and I was in Brown from 1996 till 2006, uh, and published my book, Jouissance as an Ando. As a matter of fact, it is also sitting here with me because uh, I'm going to talk about this book also in the context of my, of our, you know, uh, book that uh, I'm going to launch today. And uh, let me reintroduce also myself. I am Dr. Ashmita Kashnobish, and um, I teach at Lasalle University. Um, also, currently, I'm a, I am a research associate at Harvard Comparative Literature Studies Department. And uh, that note, I would like to start, launch our book. So uh, those of you who are the contributors of this book, uh, I also offer you uh, warm thanks. And uh, I just want to promise to you that this is the first launch, but I will run a series of shows on this book. And in the next series, I plan to invite you all, my honored contributors. So because of the constraint of time and uh, current world situation and uh, a loss in my life, uh, loss of my beloved mother, all these things uh, made it little uh, difficult for me to invite you all at this time, but you are all joining me spiritually. Okay. So um, the <clears throat> I want to show you the book and uh, post-coloniality, globalization and diaspora, what is next? Um, so the reason I want to show you, hold it for a while, because I want to uh, tell you that the book cover is very important to me because the small building that you are seeing at the in the background it's my childhood school called Bethun Collegiate School and uh, so there I went for first few years of my life and the school is very important in the sense that this was founded by uh, Isho Chandra Bidashagor who was a great friend of Ramohan Roy. And these are all uh, men who, in during the British time, tried to liberate women and uh, extend women's education. So this is very important that my parents sent me to this school. And uh, in front of it, you can see those bookstores uh, with the teen groups. This is also very important. This is the famous uh, Boipara neighborhood of books where scholars from all over the world come and visit. And I, one time I was in the uh, University of California, Berkeley in a conference and one of the uh, scholars, French scholars from University of San Diego asked me, oh, you are from Kolkutta? And uh, I know that Boipara, uh, he didn't say in English, uh, but in French, he said that uh, he knows that. Buipara, but he mentioned this. And adjacent to this, across from this uh, uh, Buipara neighborhood of books, we have our famous Calcutta University. So I spent a lot of time uh, 
planning the cover of the book because I'm always haunted by time. I always think, what if this is my last book? So I wanted to give, give a picture which is, uh, you know, very much connected to my life and my childhood. So uh, speaking of that, uh, I would like to give you a little overview of the title of the book as well. Uh, Postcoloniality, Globalization and Diaspora, What is Next? So actually this book arose from a few panels which I organized in Northeastern Modern Language Association Conference uh, over several years. And uh, the, some of the contributors, uh, they are from the diff different panels. And uh, finally, how it uh, uh, came to the <clears throat> culminating point. I was organizing this panel in 2015 called, uh, it's the same title of the book, Postcoloniality, Globalization and Diaspora, What is Next? So, uh, so I have the authors or presenters from that panel, uh, Stephanie Matthew Walsh from Ryerson University and uh, Roland Garcia from University of Barcelona, and uh, so so these two these two uh, members were this specific panel. But I also had another panel with which this whole volume started. The idea of this whole volume it is called the rethinking the concept of the postcolonial, and in that panel I had the two brilliant presenters. Uh, one of them is Marcus Arnold, who is currently in the University of Cape Town, and uh, uh, Stephanie Matthew Walsh. Uh, she also contributed. She's from Ryerson University, who I mentioned. She came, I think, two times in two different panels. So, and uh, then as I was uh, compiling all these writings, I thought that I should invite my friends. So I have. Uh, our, my dear friend, uh, Professor Henry, here, who contributed a brilliant chapter, which seemed like a book, a book within a book. Uh, I think it, it sort of uh, increased the value of this book quite a bit, tremendously. And um, I have also invited Dr. Stephanie, uh, the Dr. Ifyani Menkiti, who unfortunately passed away last year, but he was very willing to contribute and he had contributed a chapter uh, which matches very well with the theme of the book. And my, last but not the least, my dearest friend, Melanie Otto, uh, with her from Trinity College Dublin, and she contributed her chapter as well. So this is the way the weaving took place. Um, now, um, so I would also like to now plunge into the thematic discussion of the book briefly, which is that uh, as you can see from the, uh, I just want to dwell on the title a little bit more, a little longer, saying that um, the time came when postcoloniality started to my mind uh, to become a hackneyed term. Um, we use it randomly, anytime, in any conference. And I felt a little annoyed by that. And I wanted to look for a term which will go beyond postcoloniality. Then obviously, along with postcoloniality comes the terms globalization and diaspora. But I was not satisfied with any of these terms or with any of its philosophical, literary, underpinnings and I started looking for a greater goal or a better goal and I put the question mark what is next so in the panel that I organized in 2015 my I also submitted a chapter it is called philosophical afterthoughts so the formulation of the book started with that specific chapter uh, philosophical afterthoughts which I read in the conference and created a lot of repercussion. So, um, so what is next? So what I want to offer or what I've offered or what I've tried to offer 
to my literary audience, my philosopher audience, or to the wider audience is the fact that um, we need ontology. Now, you can ask me that's like too complex of a term, but I think ontology means what you have to do with the question of being, your soul, yourself. We cannot find solution to any problem in this world unless we delve into ontology. And I think if I remember correctly, our famous guest uh, in his book, Caliban's Reason, I think he mentioned the term ontic closure. And I uh, really love that term so much that I memorize it. So what I've done um, in my introductory chapter, I have uh, described the trajectory I uh, mentioned. I start with Obama's uh, Nobel Peace Prize P speech when he talks about combining the soft power and the hard power. And uh, speaking of soft power, he uh, is talking about diplomacy, but at the same time, uh, he reminded me of the book of uh, Dr. Nye of Harvard Kennedy School, who talks about combination of hard power and soft power in his book, Soft Power. And it immediately reminded me or took me to my most favorite Indian philosopher, Sri Aurobindo, and his book, The Ideal of Human Unity. And uh, his theory proposed in that book in terms of the religion of humanity. Now, what is this religion of humanity? It doesn't have to do with any quote unquote religion, but it has to do with philosophical underpinning, how we can come close to each other through a camaraderie, friendship, but that that friendship that community has to rise from one's soul. It is not a superficial friendship, but it is a very deep-rooted friendship, which is connected with your being, with your, with your ontological perception of life. And uh, so in this context, I would also say that I uh, brought in, um, because to me, no knowledge is complete unless it is integral. So I, uh, ran into this book as I was visiting Oxford, uh, as a visiting scholar, uh, giving one of my lectures. A book is called Create Dangerously by Camus. And it is taken from his Nobel uh, speech, Nobel Prize speech at the University of Uppsala. So I see the connection between Sri Aurobindo's theory of the religion of humanity and Camus' notion of friendship. And so this is all theory. So compounded with that, uh, I have a literary text, which I offer uh, in my chapter called The Battle of um, Energy Between Matter and Spirit. Battle of Energy Between Matter and Spirit. Um, so uh, in that chapter, and there's a subtitle, does it direct us to a better universe? So you can see, Patty, do you want to jump in now or should I? Oh, you go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, so I'll, maybe I'll take another uh, seven minutes, five to seven minutes. Yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. So in the chapter, the battle of energy between matter and spirit, uh, as I said, there's a, a subtitle to it. So what I do, I, um, bringing uh, the literary text. Read Oleanders. And the Bengali uh, translation of that text would be Rokto Korbi. So I bring in that text to uh, represent or to show you folks the embodiment of that theory of religion of humanity, friendship, ontology, ego transcendence, I think whatever way you want to uh, enunciate that. So uh, it is a play, it's a symbolic play, and Tagore, uh, who is Tagore? Tagore is the great poet, 
Nobel Prize winner poet of India, of Bengal, great glory. So he has been influenced by this uh, Maurice Maeterlinck. So he wrote a number of symbolic plays, and this is one of them. So what is happening here? Here you can see the um, struggle, the battle between the matter and the spirit. And the symbolically, the world of matter is portrayed in this book through Yakkapuri. What is Yakkapuri? Yakka, the literal translation of Yakka is evil, evil energy or demon. And uh, also the king Yakka, he is in charge of gold. Now gold has two different kinds of meanings in Indian philosophy. One, one meaning is that in this play it is associated with the gross matter, but gold also means according to ancient and modern Indian philosophy, a super mind or what Sri Aurobindo represents as supermental consciousness. So here you see the battle between matter represented in terms of gold and the spirit. How? Now you, here you see the, a group of laborers who are working in the coal mine. They are, uh, they are the victims of King, King uh, Yaka who doesn't come in the uh, outside near the public. He is just a voice. And so the, he represents the matter part, the gross matter which is uh, detrimental to the development of human consciousness. Now, as opposed to that, we also have a Nandini, the representative of spirit, spirit world, who uh, is having series of altercation with the king because the king of that Yakkapuri or the coal mine, a uh, gold mine, not coal mine, gold mine, is uh, matter personified. So what happens is that um, she uh, has uh, her beloved, her lover, uh, Ronjon, is the representative of light. And she wants to, with her songs, with her poetry, in her conversation with the uh, miners, she tries to represent that uh, Ronjun is coming. Ronjun is the name of our lover. Ronjun is coming. Ronjun is coming. Uh, please don't kill Ronjun because Ronjun is not just a human being. And that's why you don't see him appearing in the play, but he's coming. Only we hear that he's coming. He's coming. And uh, so finally, unfortunately, Ronjun is killed. Uh, and it is, again, it's a symbolic place, not described, but he's killed and he is uh, represented. You know, it is, it is uh, portrayed, it is announced by Nandini. And let me just give you that quotation, uh, then I'll stop. Uh, so this is the conversation between the gross matter personified king uh, in the in terms of voice and uh, and Nandini. Voice, you want Ranjan? I know. I have asked the governor to fetch him at once, but don't remain standing at the door. Voice, today is for the flag worship. Don't distract my mind. Get away from my door. Nandini, the gods have all eternity for their worship. They're not pressed for time, but the sorrows of men cannot wait. Sorrows of men cannot wait. King, deceive. These traitors have deceived me. Perdition, take them. My own machine refuses my sway. Nandini, King, they all say you know magic. Make him wake up for my sake. My magic can only put an end to the king. Alas, I know not how to awaken. So here the pain of Nandini, the poet suffering from partition. So in this, through this uh, uh, excerpt, I also introduce, talk about, and I will stop after this, another poet, uh, Jagadish Chandra Dash, his uh, poem on partition. And uh, because again, 
partition is part of what happened in the colonial time when the British left India, they divided the country, they fragmented the country, they created Pakistan. There was no Pakistan, it was an in integral India. And the poets uh, and his uh, sadness expressed in that, uh, so I'll end after this poem, I'll just read this poem and stop. Uh, uh, why the poet writes, I'm translating, um, so my point is that I'm seeking a solution from the problem that occurs through discrimination. One party looking down upon the other. If one looks through history, one could find many such moments of discrimination, which are beyond my reach of knowledge as a singular human being. I'm presenting here one poem translated by myself to offer you an example of one of these moments. Why cannot I write why, sorry, why cannot I unite the earth and the sky? The more the sky becomes wide, the earth shrinks and your relatives get lost in the coal mine. Just like the laborers of the coal mine of Rotibari, a specific place the poet is referring to. I think it is now in Bangladesh. Being underground locked for 125 hours in darkness, my sisters, villagers, relatives, neighbors of my country. They're also imprisoned within the cave of Pakistan. They did not die, sucked in the life of death before death. One day, death will come, but did not yet. Their hope did not die, did not get extinguished. Jagadish Chandra Dash. The poem with intense tone reminds me of Shashi Tharu's speech on Britain owes reparations to India. So um, I just wanted to give a little sample uh, from my chapter. And uh, the Indian diplomat, Shoshi Tharoor, uh, he created a huge repercussion, which I like, about India, I mean, about British giving reparation to India. And he's not asking for money, but he's talking about one pound per day for next 300 years. So. Uh, this is a tangible solution, but I'm also seeking beyond that solution through consciousness. Now, uh, I take took a long time. I give it to oh, my uh, and then I can uh, come back. Do you want me to introduce your chapter a little bit? Then oh, no. Let me ask you some questions. Okay. No, uh, that was an excellent introduction uh, to the book uh and uh, to your chapter you. you know i i am a sociologist and a philosopher so i always feel a little you know intimidated coming after poets and writers you guys put things so beautifully uh all i have is cold logic <laughs> you know uh so no that was very nice I really love the poetry, beautiful, uh, you know. So uh, my questions <laughs> may seem a little technical, a little cold uh, after that, 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 that beautiful reading. But uh, to me, <clears throat> uh, when I think about, um, you know, globalization today, uh, I think about diaspora. Uh, we we are globalizing, right? Uh, mm -hmm. In in very political and economic terms. Uh, in other words, what 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 we mean by globalization today uh, is basically uh, the 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 global communications made possible by the internet and a series of economic and political reforms uh, you know that have facilitated international trade uh, and um, in a way uh, has you know has been used to undermine uh, the power of trade unions workers uh, and things like that so 
even though we are globalizing and this globalization is communicative, political, and economic, there's nothing moral or spiritual uh, that is accompanying or being facilitated by this globalization. And I mentioned uh, in particular the issue of workers uh, because it just to point out the fact that what we were doing before the kind of class inequalities, class domination, racial domination, mm -hmm. all of the conflicts that uh, plagued us when we were existing, you know, let's say within nations and empires, we have brought these same conflicts to this so-called globalized world mm -hmm. that, that we've created. And uh, we have not really made any sustained effort to build uh, a cultural, aesthetic, and in particular spiritual component to this project uh, of globalization. So from your point of view, as someone who is really pushing, uh, <clears throat> you know, the importance of spirituality, uh, the importance of, uh, you know, the ideas and philosophies, the ontologies mm -hmm. of Aurobindo and Tagore, really two great men that, that, that you know I admire. Uh, I see globalization and what we're doing uh, at the present moment uh, as all forms of political and economic ego building that they are, yes, they are strengthening our political and economic egos. They're allowing us to adapt to the economic realities and the political realities uh, of the world, very necessary things. But at the same time, uh, we've always brought a lot of conflict, a lot of fighting, a lot of discrimination, a lot of hatred to economic and political issues. So often they've led to wars, right? And uh, so even though uh, we have made this move now, uh, towards globalization and we talk about, oh, it's one world, the world is now a village. It, it still doesn't really feel like a village. I feel a lot of the old hatreds, a lot of the old conflicts and tensions are still very much with us. And that in fact, uh, we've put our spiritual projects on hold uh, and we are just working at globalization in terms of economics, politics, and communication. So I was wondering, you know, how you felt about those trends, you know, the fact that this model of globalization seems to be a-spiritual, let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I have I could respond to that. Uh, I think uh, uh, it first reminds me. I'll go back to one of uh, you know her also Melanie's conversation with me when I delivered my lecture in Trinity College Dublin on uh, my previous book, uh, Negotiating Capability and Diaspora Philosophical Politics, and. Uh, I asked her, we had a conversation, we were discussing, what is the point, you know, this um, capitalism, this uh, greed, all these things are growing in the name of globalization. What is the point of my writing or my lecture or doing any kind of writing along that line? Uh, she said, she and I agreed finally that 
it is relevant because we uh, somebody has to write and if nobody takes the responsibility then we'll go down we'll sink down even more into the darkness and uh, so after that i also would like to say that uh, more specifically that you're addressing about this as i understood economic greed hatred uh, a spiritual condition i think this is uh, seems to be a little coarse and i addressed that in two of my uh, previous books monographs in negotiating capability and uh, diaspora I specifically i took it upon myself i undertook the challenge that uh, that i need to find a solution to this problem and what is the problem somebody may be even surprised she's a literary theorist why is she working on the theory of an economist amartya sen his line uh, minorities underdogs women they always have to adapt to the status of the second class citizen and when his book idea of justice came out because i had first encounter with him in uh, in india when he was launching his book argumentative indian because he is an economist i mean i have no uh, connection with him but in that book when he's launching it i first made my connection when i asked him the question uh, because at that time my juison sananando this book came out and uh, his grandfather he is uh, kidi mohan acharya he was the vice chancellor of tagore's university in shantiniketan so i asked him the question that i loved your lecture but you didn't talk about spirituality and he told me that that is my grandfather's job i he deals with upanishad i don't so you can see even among the indians there is this little resistance but when i when i read his book idea of justice at the same time the proposition the problem that you are mentioning he talks about it that uh, minorities underdog women all of us uh, we have to adapt to the status of the same class citizen and at the time really in my real life i'm struggling with that i was shocked that i am a minority i cannot tolerate that term and it was like a bombshell on me when i first i'm called minority when it dawned on me i'm a minority i'm not so so uh, i experienced those problems in my real life and of course hatred also uh, one of my students was saying the other day she was in a panel with the bu students where they were discussing how invisible the that people become even if you are women you become even more if you are coming from a different country you don't acknowledge if you are coming from a different country you are invisible she is from nigeria she was telling me so problem of invisibility problem of hatred and uh, even in the current climate nobody knows it more than now because what happened with floyd and what is happening in even in our election so but my uh, solution is still i would talk about solution i keep on harping on it in all my books i get even uh, shocked myself that how uh, and my one of my daughters still how you are so resilient you know you have no end of suffering but you go, you keep on talking about solution so solution is my theme why and again i'll just go back very briefly repeating that uh, i offered the solution as political sublime in my second book humanitarian identity political sublime intervention of a post colonial feminist as i was terribly perturbed by 911 and i thought jason sanand did not do anything i have to give another theory and i deconstructed kantian theory and offered my new kantian theory as political sublime meaning practicing ego transcendence in everyday life and then also it occurred to me that it's still not doing anything and then i wrote my book negotiating capability uh that dies for a philosophical politics where i combined the theory of amartya sen and uh some other spiritual philosophy of sri aurobindo and also john rawls because uh, you may not be 
that kind of John Rawls, but in John Rawls's theory, I got that touch of ego transcendence because uh, he says, he combines these two terms that under comprehensive doctrines, we have different kinds of differences, our ethnic difference, religious difference, gender difference, but for the sake of political justice, we need to bypass this difference. We need to transcend this difference. We need to put on a veil of ignorance. Then only we can love everyone. We can come to, to a camaraderie with each other. So but Shane raises the question that that paradigm is a little flawed because in that uh, bypassing difference process, you may erase the differences. So he talks about his theory of capability that you have to unfold that master slip dialectic, but that is not enough. You also have to keep striving. And I also interpret his theory as willpower, that as immigrant, you don't give up. As women, you don't give up. As minority, you don't give up. That is called willpower. And that is coming from his theory of capability. So in the concluding chapter of that book, Conclusion Philosophical Politics, I suggest a combination, a synthesis of Shen's theory of capability and uh, Rawls's theory of ego transcendence, I call it, and bringing in uh, also Aurobindo and Omartha Shen together. So now it remains to what extent we can accept that ideal vision, but, uh, but that is my vision. I mean, I will keep on persevering and hoping and hoping that what we call universalism, Bishwajaninata in Tagore's term, the, loving the world as yourself, or Boshudhaiva um, Kutumbokam, that's the Upanishadic term again, the whole world is my home. So I still have to ground myself. I know the world will say no to me, but I'll keep striving, sorry. Very good. <laughs> Taking too long, sorry. Yeah. Uh, now, I would uh, ask you to introduce your beautiful chapter. I'll give you one line. And uh, as, I, as I said, it's like a book within a book. It has the strength of uh, becoming a whole book after neoliberalism and post-structuralism. Um, Post yes, so, yes. So I think here you also grounded yourself and that is the best part of your chapter where you are bringing in Derrida. Uh, you, you are being the, seeing the connection between spirituality that is conveyed through our Indian philosophical text and in the scholar, famous philosopher, Sri Aurobindo, who we, both you and I like, his uh, originary vibrations, mantra, uh, because it used to be said in our Indian philosophy, Kabir Manishi, the poets are the visionary. The, in the original vibration, originary vibrations, I love the term you mentioned, and its connection with the uh, archer writing of Derrida, but the pity of uh, postcolonial, so-called postcolonial scholars of us is that we are in denial. We don't acknowledge our own text and our own philosophy as the mainstream philosophy. We automatically put it to the bottom shelf. And that has been done in one of the books, I think in Postcolonial Reason um, by our very beloved critic, uh, Gayatri Spivak, who we love from her, her book, Grammatology. But uh, um, after reading the chapter one more time, I was seeing the connection uh, she writing and uh, originary vibrations and the way it is not acknowledged. Ash writing is a metaphysical writing. It's writing beyond writing. Uh, I wonder if Derrida was taking it from Panishad. And I stop here. Uh, now you have to pour us with your yeah. Well, no, in, in, in writing uh, that paper, I was you know, looking at the crisis of globalization from the point of view of uh, the, the periphery, that uh, the whole project of globalization, to me, 
went into crisis after the 2008 financial crisis. That since that year, we, the global economy had not, has not been uh, running on neoliberal principles. Uh, so that something else uh, has replaced it. You can call it um, quantitative infinity, uh, modern monetary theory. These are some of the terms that have been used to describe uh, the current principles of global economic management. Uh, and um, so I just wanted to make that clear that uh, the, the, the nature of globalization uh, is, is, you know, being confronted by um, the possibilities of a real change. It's not clear exactly what is next, but the, the way in which we've been doing business since around 1980 has changed. And uh, so the question is, what are the economists in India, in the Caribbean, in Africa, what are we going to do, right, now that things are changing? Are we going to wait for another Western theory? Uh, or are we going to go back to our own economic theorizing the way we were doing before the rise of uh, global, you know, neoliberal globalization? So that was one thing that I was trying to raise in terms of addressing the question, what next? So I think in the first part of the essay, I'm suggesting that uh, an opportunity has arisen for us to help to define uh, how we want to manage our economies uh, in the years ahead. And then the second thing that I wanted to address in the paper was the dominance of post-structuralism that I thought uh, the way in which uh, most scholars in the developing countries appropriated uh, post-structuralism uh, resulted in an eclipsing of, um, you know, uh, what was going on in countries like India and the Caribbean. It's not to say we didn't have you know, theories of language, uh, theories of cultural criticism uh, going on before. That uh, before the rise of post-structuralism in the Caribbean, we had a very vigorous, vibrant uh, theory of Creole uh, criticism. I mean, you know, very strong. Uh, and so all of that uh, got sidelined in some cases, uh, displaced, decentered by uh, post-structuralism. And so I, th I thought it was important to analyze why did it have this power to displace Caribbean Creole theory, you know? Mm -hmm. And this is why I took up the question uh, of language, that when you look at post-structuralism, uh, it's basically making language, and in particular, the semiotics of language, a new ontology. So I was very glad that you raised the question uh, of ontology. Mm -hmm. And so uh, basically, what, what happens with post-structuralism is that they're saying, uh, you know, the foundation of things is no longer spirit. It's not matter. Uh, it's not reason, right? They were very, you know, opposed to enlightenment notions uh, of reason and all of that. 
And what they were saying uh, is that there was something about language. And in particular, the semiotics of language. Derrida called it difference, mm -hmm. arch writing, uh, you know. But the bottom line is, is that as an ontology, uh, it was saying to us that when you analyze society, you have to look at society as a text. You know, look at it as uh, a written, a written reality, mm -hmm. that it is the product of the same arch writing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to create a literary text. And so looking at society as a text, looking uh, at Caribbean literature, Caribbean poems, Caribbean theater, Caribbean economics, as a product of this arch writing, you see, uh, was, you know, it's, again, as an ontological suggestion, I don't have, I didn't have a problem with it. You know, it was in many ways liberating. It obviously had a lot of intellectual energy in it, no question about that. Uh, but the question that many people who adopted it failed to ask themselves, is this really good for the Caribbean? Is this really good for India? You know, do we really need this? You know, or is this something that was good that France needed, that French intellectual culture needed at the time? Why, why this need to reverse the relationship between speech and writing? Because at the heart of this linguistic turn was this inversion of the relationship. Mm -hmm. between speech and writing, right? That, uh, you know, do we really need that in the Caribbean? That's what I was asking, right? And I was never convinced that, that, that we needed it, sure. Mm. Okay, because, because you are giving such rich knowledge, I'm, I'll forget. So, so if I understand correctly, so arch writing is, it's already there. It's like almost metaphysical writing, which yeah. we have in Caribbean literature, Creole in India. And we talk about, sometimes we had the argument also, we, we even I talked about whether uh, Plato, Aristotle, they took from India. I was very enchanted by that. I said, no, no, it came from India. So, <laughs> so then the conclusion is that the French post-structuralists, did they create a sort of a simulated facade saying that this is better than what you folks have, the post-structuralist? Uh, Not uh, quite. You see, they didn't say that. We took it that way. That's the problem in this case. Oh, what, what, the question is why? Well, no, no, that's the good question. And I would suggest that it's the status, the cultural capital uh, of, of, of Western, in, the Western intellectuals. Uh, you know, uh, and so when I analyzed the relationship between, uh, you know, Aurobindo, Aurobindo's theory of language and Derrida's theory of language as examined by Gayatri, Gayatri Spivak, you just saw the way she automatically assumed that uh, Derrida's theory of language was the one that was more general and therefore could replace the, uh, Aurobindo's theory of language. In the same way, in the Caribbean, right, uh, it was the same assumption that uh, you could replace uh, Caribbean Creole theory uh, with arch writing. That arch writing could contain, you know, uh, Caribbean Creole theory, but Caribbean Creole theory could not contain arch writing. And so that's why I, um, in the paper I said, you know, if we take uh, Aurobindo's notion 
of seed sounds, right? Mm -hmm. That uh, that at the heart of language, right, were these basic sounds, right? And that uh, these sounds had within them the potential uh, to create or you know accumulate. I think would be better here. Yeah? Uh, almost a kind of material dimension to them, which is which would be the structure of everyday language. That uh, a number of social conventions could crystallize around these these seed sounds. Mm -hmm. uh, that would give us the body of language. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, he was saying that these seed sounds, right, could also echo higher levels of consciousness yeah. all the way up to what he calls the supramental yeah. uh, yeah. level, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, that, so I said, you know, if I had been um, Gayatri, the question I would ask would be, couldn't, uh, I'm not saying that this is, should be done, but this is what occurred to me, that uh, Aurobindo spoke about, you know, these material and social accretions on these seed sounds, right, would conceal and hide, right, the mm -hmm. fundamental nature of language. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't we, couldn't we say that post-structuralism was a yoga? You could look at it as a yoga, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. For right uh, mm -hmm. silencing, yes. transcending mm -hmm. these accretions, mm -hmm. you know, uh, on on these fundamental seed sounds mm -hmm. that he says is the basis of language, and just the fact that that possibility. Mm -hmm. never arose was what bothered me because I saw it in the Caribbean. We, we never, the, the, the question as to whether or not Caribbean Creole theory uh, could be in an equitable dialogue with a post-structure just never arose. Never mind the possibility that you could try and read post-structuralism within the categories our Caribbean Creole theory. So it was that fundamental inequality that we, you know, it wasn't Derrida didn't come down to the Caribbean and say, this is what you have to do. Neither did Foucault. Okay. It was our theory. Right. Yeah. So the, that's the, what bothered me. That's why it's like a, when you become colonized, you have a, <laughs> like a, Mentality of a second class citizen. <laughs> they cannot come yeah, up. Uh, yeah. So thank you. I think this, uh, because I love post structuralist theory, and um, so do you, and you do as well. And um, we have the same, exactly same ontological, spiritual, philosophical, post structuralist pattern, paradigm in our literature, philosophy, language. But we're mismanaging it, or we are kind of uh, puzzled, and we are just yeah. Th this is totally wrong, and I'm so happy that you try to demystify. Yes, the 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 reason you know that uh, I have this love for Deleuze and Guattari, <laughs> and uh, I continuously I'm pursuing, like I'm just like pursuing them for last several years because for the term rhizome, uh, which you also mentioned, or for their uh, deterritorialization. De and uh, it's not, then I often question, am I being biased? No, I'm not biased. And your point made it clear. It's because I see some nuance of Indian philosophy, some nuance of spirituality, some nuance of uh, expansion of the soul or the heart, infinity in there. So I'm looking for the infinity and that infinity I, I, I occasionally, not occasionally, quite a few times I encounter in their language, in their uh, terms. So likewise, uh, I love Derrida, obviously. And, uh, you know, that note of infinity that, no, what is this? Is this my supervisor? Is this a table? This is a table. How do you define it? It is everything, not a pen, 
not a computer, not a phone, not a diary, but you are not saying what is it. So it goes like, through, it's called neti in our philosophy, neti, 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 negation. Then through negation you are going. Yeah, but so it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, theory that you gave in my book. It's an honor of the book that you are redefining, recalculating the status of post-structuralism and the status of our own indigenous literature and philosophy, and that often we are mistaken, and we should not be. Well, uh, I also I, love the term rhizome, and the term that you use that um, is not like an em, em, empirical tall tree. The Caribbean language is like a vine and rhizome. Where I that's the reason I brought in even Deleuze. I got that uh, Deleuzean uh, nuance and. Uh, a lot of authors. I would love to know if you, if you can mention a little bit about uh, Sylvia Winter. Talk about her, or Glissant. I always wanted to know more about Glissant. So in terms of realization or this note of infinity. Oh yeah. You see the appeal. What what sort of brought I think post-colonial thought and post-structuralism together is that they were both. Uh, very dissatisfied with the strictures of enlightenment thought. The concept of the universal set of laws that you had to live by and, and operate within that, uh, you know, there was a feeling that they look universal, but they're not absolutely universal. That there one could live outside of these laws and uh you know not 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 be killed or you know your life would not be ruined so there was a feeling that there was something beyond the universalism uh of of, of enlightenment philosophy and in particular uh i think the the, the role uh of reason Yes. Right? That in the Sri West, Aurobindo, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. Sri Aurobindo also very much uh, invade against it, saying that reason is too infinite for truth. He said in the ideal of human unity, which I used my in my book, Humanity and Identity, Political Sublime, that I, I call it new enlightenment theory, as you are saying. So I'm very glad that uh, you're explaining this right. uh, you see, they, they, of reason and how the post-structuralists, they try to demystify this. Right. Let's, let's carry on. And we in the Caribbean had been pushing against these notions of reason because we knew that they had these racist undertones, right? So that you had these ideas that peoples of African descent lacked the capacity to reason or that somehow our reasonings were not universal, didn't have the same significance yeah. as European reasonings. So uh, from a different uh, experience, we were challenging, right? The universality of these concepts of reasons. Mm -hmm. And then uh, now in post-structuralism, for a different set of reasons, they were also challenging uh, these concepts of uh, universality that came out of the Enlightenment tradition. So there was the convergence, you see. Yeah. But in, in that convergence, we somehow uh, decided to take second place, you know? Yeah. That, so, that, that, that our critiques were somehow secondary yes. yeah. uh, to, to the post-structuralist critiques. So it's not, as I said, this is not a critique of post-structuralism in terms of rejecting it. And I'm not blaming post-structuralists. It's how we internalized it and it's decided. our fault, it. yes. Yeah, I, so, we, gotta, we gotta take the responsibility. You gotta get it straight, yes. This time, Please. yeah. Well, mm -hmm. One more question which came out of what you just said that, so the post-structuralist or critic reason, but not, is it the same reason that uh, the Kant and, you know, the Enlightenment philosophers talked about? Because you talked about the universal concept of reason. And uh, also I see that 
Amartya Sen in his theory also very much grounds the reason. Uh, but that's a different story. But if you can tell me a little bit more about what is this universal aspect of reason that the post structurally specifically challenged, right? Well, yeah, I mean, if you look at it, uh, they just, you can raise the question, what does reason exclude? Does it really, uh, you know? Emotion. It, is, is, it, is it really universal, right? Uh, and so I think that um, the universality of, of, of reason is conditioned or limited by the fact that it tends to be either technical or instrumental. It's technical, instrumental thinking, right? And as you said, if, if, you're, if you're dealing with human emotions, you're dealing with aesthetics, you're dealing with spirituality, uh, it has its limitations, right? So uh, there, there are a variety of ways in which you can look at the limitations of reason uh, while at the same time acknowledging its contributions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not like a war against reason. It's just a matter of acknowledging uh, its limitations, right? Uh -huh. and, uh, <clears throat> and so we had that going in the Caribbean, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and because in order, you know, to assert our philosophical tradition, mm -hmm. right, we had to interrogate uh, Western reason. Yes, yes. Because Western reason had got us wrong. And uh, you'd asked me about Sylvia Winter, mm -hmm. but I think that Sylvia is one of the people who really, really, uh, got that right because, uh, you know, she was at first, you know, a dancer, a playwright, uh, and a novelist. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, she became this theorist. And so she explains how she became a theorist. And she says, you know, one day it occurred to her, why is this the novel, this form that I love so much, mm -hmm. why does it always get my people wrong? Mm. She was always dissatisfied with the portrayal of awesome. peoples of African descent in uh, European fiction, right? Mm -hmm. And so she says, I need a theory of writing. writing. That's what I need. I have to understand, mm -hmm. you know, why this great art form mm -hmm. keeps getting my people wrong. Yeah. Is it? Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the same thing that we had uh, in philosophy, that uh, you look at it. On what basis are you saying that African people don't have the capacity to reason and therefore to do philosophy. You know, overcoming that hurdle was really serious, you know? Yeah. Just asserting that, you know, you, you had a philosophical tradition, right? Uh, and um, I mean, I don't wanna go no. through all of the difficulties we had, you know, um, getting <laughs> philosophy classes taught at Brown and all of that, uh, but yeah. It, 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 it was a hurdle that had to be overcome. One had to question the universality of Western reason mm -hmm. because it got us wrong. And it was the same thing that Winter was experiencing mm -hmm. in Western literature. She was always disturbed by the fact that this literature kept getting peoples of African descent wrong. Yes. Very interesting. Yeah, that you told me this part that she had to. Uh, yes, it's almost like I chose to write. Why I chose to write one book after another book? I'm not satisfied. I'm not pleasing people. I'm not appealing to the audience. So she felt that art forms 
that she's using, they're not adequate. She has to come up. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, she yeah. had to understand. Because, I mean, she, she's not just, you know, an artist through and through. As I said, she, you know, she was a dancer, a playwright, and a novelist. And then, you know, it's like, okay, uh, why are these literary forms letting me down? Why are they embarrassing me? You know? Uh, yeah. It reminds me of our, one of our seminar thing we had in Brown, in Pembroke Center one time, aesthetic politics and difference. I think that that seminar that, but I, I wonder why, why there should, would be any, any divide between aesthetics and politics. And I mean, it is possible because like I do in my work, I mean, I have to use, I cannot just interpret books, novels, but I have to have some theory. So the combination, but, uh, but I think art has that power, like Radio Leanders has that, uh, message right that heavy rich message that uh the uh, the king of gold you know is the king of gross matter and that matter just just the monetary wealth but just it includes everything like hatred anger stupidity a human folly everything how you overcome that so i think we should go for a more uh, integral mode and uh, maybe that is what I was targeting in this book, what is next? Like, uh, because I also, another thing which disturbs me is that there is a divide between, because there's so much resistance to spirituality in the academia that you, the spirituality gets dumped as theological something, right? And there is a altercation between the uh, theologians and the academicians. Like, if you are a theologian, you cannot be an academician. If you're an academician, you cannot be a theologian. But that uh, part of that um, dilemma, conflict was resolved, I found in Tony Morrison's work. You know, the way I also, the, I took Beloved, I think, in Fanon's Black Skin, White Moss, I teach my students that each chapter each, each chapter of Black Skin, White Mass ends on the note of transcendence that uh, make my soul uh, that I can rise, you know, if I remember. Okay. Make, yeah, so continuously he's harping. And I remember that I talk about Fanon through, uh, and Aurobindo, the, I brought them together in one of my uh, previous books. And in this book also introduction, I was, when I was looking at it today, I brought Fanon as well, because Fanon offers us that solution. And uh, so my question to you is why, what could we do? That's what I'm trying to do, striving to do, to bridge the gap. And uh, uh, in general, in Indian, Indian philosophy, there is no divide between philosophy and psychoanalysis even, and literature, as you can see, Tego did this. But there is this, you know, Western divide. So what is the way to go now that all we are living in this virtuality, in virtual world? And do you think it will increase our capacity of integration or it will make us even more split? Well, as I said, I don't know because I think we are definitely uh, at the end of the neoliberal era. And it's not yet clear what the next step, the next phase is going to be. But I think uh, the last 40 years uh, is coming to an end. That, uh, you, know, um, you know, issues of gender, sexuality, as you can see, have become so much more prominent uh, than they were before. Uh, we'll have to see what that means, uh, yes. you know. Uh, the things are changing. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I don't have the prophetic powers <laughs> to see too far into, into the future. But I, I think that um, the, the way we continue to conduct 
our nation building, the way we can continue to manage our economies, mm -hmm. and the way we conduct our politics. These, to me, are the big obstacles in the way mm -hmm. of our spiritual advancement. That uh, we, we put so much effort. Uh, we've made making a living so difficult that it takes all of people's energies, that there's not a lot of time left to be artistic, to be spiritual, mm -hmm. to be philosophical, reflective. That side of life, I still think, uh, is being eclipsed to too great a degree. Uh, and that's part of the crisis of modernity. Well, let's say Western modernity. Western modernity. Yeah. I think, you know, uh, resonating with that, I think I, I said here in the introduction, uh, if we uh, we go back to our countries, we travel without a passport, we practice ethics. And some of the solution, talking about solution. Um, so I'm, I'm saying here, um, in my Lex Media television interview a couple of years ago, Noam Chomsky talks about this, asking me if I want an optimistic or a realistic answer, asked him the same question. He alludes to consciousness in almost every chapter of the book. Uh, sorry, in this regard, I find Fanon highly optimistic. He alludes to consciousness in almost every chapter of the book of black skinned white masks. He refers to the term transcendence and ontology. He talks about overcoming the problem. I would say that we have reached a time at which if we do not mention optimism, the world will move to extinction. We go back to our countries, we travel without a passport, we practice ethics. So uh, we're almost toward the end of the uh, session, uh, but I would love to know what would you respond to that, to my slogan, we go back to, do you think the problem will be solved if we go back to our countries and we travel without passport. Um, because, you know. Sure. Uh, you know, it, it, it's again, you know, how, how do you um, create enough space, time, uh, and when I say space, I mean institutional space uh, for spirituality in the modern period? that as you were saying earlier uh within the academy uh spirituality occupies this tiny space if any space at all right uh -huh. uh, no because some 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 uh universities like brown uh -huh. now have um programs in contemplative studies right mm -hmm. so uh that that that's significant but still, uh, I think uh, in terms of uh, surviving economically and politically, mm -hmm. uh, it takes up so much of our time, our energy, that it leaves very, very, very little room uh, for moral, growth, moral and spiritual growth. I don't think that we have grown morally and spiritually uh you know but we have you know just advanced technologically we keep advancing along you know that dimension uh but in fact i think maybe morally and spiritually we could be actually regressing you know uh that we are not moving towards that awareness that deep down at our ontological core, there's a spiritual reality, something we need to cultivate, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that at core, you know, is our Atman, you know, that we are one with Brahman. That consciousness, the awareness of that, I don't think at the moment we are moving closer, closer. to come into that reality. I think the, our, our economics and our politics, uh, because they're so badly organized at the moment, uh, are really getting in the way. 
uh, you know, everybody's protecting themselves. This is my turf, you know. I mean, you know, even I mean, if you look at India right now under Modi, you know, I I, I just I just don't think that the country is uh, expressing that deep spirituality that the deep spirituality of India no, no. is being trapped nationalistically. No, Rather, women who are abroad, we miss our country, almost like a nostalgia. We do more philosophy or spirituality than, uh, because there's the Western influence and uh, false imitation sometimes. You know, as Amata I do, wrote in her, in her one of her stories, no, no sweetness here. You know, wig. That's the name of the story. My students love that. Mm. So mm. we need to end soon. Okay. Well, this was wonderful. You know. Thank and you. I really enjoyed it. Night on post-structuralism. So I have a new view about it. Another time, maybe I'll hear more about your uh, enunciation of new liberalism and new colonialism. Uh, but thank you so much for coming. Thank you. All right. Pleasure. Okay.